of a NASA well, launch down here, or even in the movies, you see a countdown clock. That's this is the new one. It's it is updated. It, it's an LCD one now. The, well, it's a video board. Yes. Uh, the old clock currently lives at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, mm -hmm. which is their uh, a museum and theme park. Yeah. Uh, but it lives over there, and I took some pictures with that because the last mission, I think, one of the last missions that served was uh, SDS-135, which mm. I went to and mm -hmm. was standing behind that clock which for that long. Same location. Um, that's a little bit further yeah. back than the other one. There was, uh -huh. there was about 20 feet. Behind the clock that you could stand uh, between the clock and the bank. Mm -hmm. um, so I was behind it. Now it's it's kind of moved it. They moved it further back towards the bank, um, as I recall. Uh, but, yeah, we're at T minus 10 minutes and holding. And we're just waiting for the next poll. We're also monitoring NASA TV to uh, see if we can get an update from them. Keep those questions coming. You know, we do. We are entering into this launch window, and uh, we do have time. So we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to uh, try at least to answer <laughs> uh, most of your questions. So uh, you've been hearing throughout the broadcast all the different science that returning to the moon will enable us to do. So there's actually something called the Prime One Mining ex Experiment, and that's going to robotically look for ice and other resources below the lunar surface. NASA's first polar resources ice mining experiment, also known as Prime One, will robotically look for ice and other resources below the lunar surface. Thanks to data from spacecraft orbiting the moon, scientists believe that the polar regions contain water ice in the form of ice just below the surface. With the right technologies, that ice is a game-changing resource that can be mined and used to produce propellant and breathable oxygen for future explorers. Under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, the agency selected intuitive machines to fly and land Prime-1 on the Moon's South Pole. Prime-1 will land near the Shackleton Crater to drill into the lunar soil in an area that could contain water ice. Prime-1 is made up of two instruments, Trident, the regolith and ice drill for exploring new terrain, and M-SOLO, the mass spectrometer observing lunar operations. Trident will drill up to three feet into the lunar surface, extract lunar soil, and bring it up to the surface. Trident drills to its maximum depth in multiple phases, stopping at different increments. As it reaches each desired depth, it will pause and retract the drill string to deposit lunar soil on the surface for analysis. This is where M-SOLO comes in. M-SOLO is a commercial off-the-shelf mass spectrometer modified for spaceflight. It will evaluate the chemical elements and compounds released from the lunar soil for water and other chemical compounds. Trident will then proceed to the next specified depth and repeat the process until samples at all desired depths have been analyzed for water. If no ice is found where Prime 1 lands, NASA will still collect valuable information about drilling into the lunar soil for a future mission. NASA's Viper, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, will use Prime 1 technology on a mobile robot that will navigate the moon's south pole searching for additional resources. Prime-1 data will help NASA assess lunar resources to inform future Artemis missions and a robust human presence on the Moon. So we are, away, we are still awaiting a new T-0 for today's launch attempt, but for more on what to expect when we launch uh, for this first day, let's go to NASA's Dan Hewitt. He's inside our Apollo Saturn V Center at the KSC Visitor Complex. Hey, thanks, Megan. Everybody, welcome back to the moon board. There's a lot of people here in the complex. I just heard a woo-hoo. People are getting in and out because we have a great view of launch when it's going to happen, and it's going to happen today. But that launch is just the first step in the Artemis 1 mission. So let's look at what's ahead for this historic first flight. As we just said, launch is step number one. Those four RS-25 engines throttle up, followed shortly after by the two solid rocket boosters igniting, sending SLS and Orion skyward. Now on our way uphill, we'll have a number of jettison events. You'll be able to see things coming off of the SLS rocket. 
One of the most visual ones will be these two solid rocket boosters. Now they'll expend their propellant a little over two minutes into the flight. They will separate. We'll see them flare off onto either side and then the core stage continues to fire. We're also going to see the launch abort system come off the top. Once you get high enough in the atmosphere, it's no longer required. You could actually do aborts using engines on Orion and its service module. I will also note that on the launch abort system, it's got those three solid rocket motors. The jettison motor is active. The abort and the attitude ones are not for this flight. We don't have people, so we're not flying a fully active abort system. We also have three fairings that are there to protect Orion, the service module and the crew module, as we're flying up through the really dense parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Next up, we'll hit core stage separation. So we've got four main engines. We'll hear Miko, main engine cutoff. Those engines will shut down, the core stage will separate, drop away. It's eventually gonna splash down in the ocean. And that hands over the propulsion duties to this, our upper stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. Its first job is to execute what's known as a perigee raise maneuver. So the perigee is the lowest part of your orbit. You have a perigee that's your low part and an apogee that's your highest point. We're gonna raise up the perigee and that's gonna actually put us in a nice circular path around the planet. And while we're there, that gives us time to check out Orion. We're flying it in space for the second time, the first time in this fully integrated stack with SLS. We'll be able to look at all of Orion's systems, make sure those solar arrays are capturing the sun's energy and turning it into electrical power for Orion systems, make sure the communications are working, all of our guidance, navigation, and control. That is your time to make sure you have a healthy spacecraft before you do something that is going to send it to the moon. And that's next up on our list. That's the translunar injection. For today's launch profile, that's going to be a firing of about 18 minutes of that single engine on the upper stage. Now that engine optimized for a vacuum. It's producing about 24,000 pounds of thrust. So it's a pretty big engine and it's doing that because we need enough energy to be able to send our payload, Orion, beyond low Earth orbit and send it on a path to head out to the moon. Now after that burn is complete, ICPS separates. It's gonna do what's called a disposal burn. So it's gonna send itself on a path from Earth around the moon and slingshot out into what's known as a heliocentric orbit. So it's gonna completely leave the Earth-Moon system and go into orbit around our sun. But after it separates, propulsion duties get handed over to this, the European Service Module. And it's got a couple of different engines that it's gonna be using. And we're gonna be testing those out just on day one. We're gonna do what's called the Outbound Trajectory Correction Burn 1. And we'll do a couple of these trajectory corrections as we're flying out to the moon. But that first one is that first critical test of this large engine, the Orbital Maneuvering System engine. That's the one that has the most thrust, generating about 6,000 pounds of force in a vacuum. And that's what's going to be doing a lot of our maneuvers, or giving us that pushing power as we do these maneuvers around the moon to enter into what's known as Distant Retrograde Orbit, or DRO. And that's this dotted line that you see around here. Now we call it distant, basically because of the distance we're away from the moon, we're about 40,000 miles, a little bit less, off the lunar surface. And then we call it retrograde because the moon orbiting planet Earth in this direction, going in a counterclockwise fashion, we're gonna be entering into a clockwise orbit around the moon, opposite retrograde. Now to do that, we're gonna get in close, we're gonna dip in off the lunar surface, we're gonna be about 80 miles, 80 statute miles off the lunar surface as we do this outbound powered flyby. Again, the major thrust coming from that orbital maneuvering system engine. After we do that, we'll do a final maneuver to actually go into that distant retrograde orbit, that DRO. Now, why DRO? Why are we not just going around the moon and coming back on like a free return trajectory, which we did on some of the Apollo missions? Well, in DRO, it's a very stable orbit. It doesn't require a lot of fuel to maintain that area around the moon. So it gives you a lot of time to really test the spacecraft. If you followed with any launch of a new spacecraft, you know there's only so much testing you can do on the ground. Once you actually put all of that hardware in space, in the environment that it's gonna be operating, hundreds of thousands of miles away from Earth, 
you're going to learn things you didn't even realize about everything from communications, the life support systems, the thermal control, everything on a spacecraft needs to get put through its paces in this environment before we put people on board, and that's why we're heading out to DRO. Eventually, though, it's going to be time to come home, and we will do a DRO departure maneuver. This, again, firing up that orbital maneuvering system engine and others on the service module, and this is what's going to commit us from leaving the moon and heading on back towards Earth. We'll dip in once more, close off the lunar surface, slingshot and use the lunar gravity to do this return powered flyby, and then similar to the way out, we can make correction burns as we kind of fine tune our path back towards the Earth. And then it's time for re-entry. A couple of things happen before that. One of the really critical ones, spacecraft separation. We're going to detach the European service module shortly before re-entry, its job largely done. That burns up in the Earth's atmosphere and reveals on the crew module the heat shield. I circled it earlier. This is goal number one of the Artemis mission. Artemis one mission is testing this heat shield at lunar return velocities because when we make that trip around the moon and we come back, we are going in speeds of excess of 20,000 miles an hour. So when we slam into the Earth's atmosphere, it's going to heat that thing up to more, excuse me, more than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for the Artemis 1 profile, we're going to do what's known as a skip re-entry. So basically you can come in too shallow and skip off the atmosphere, too, uh, too narrow, and you're going to do what's known as a ballistic entry, which really heats things up. We're going to do kind of a mix where we're going to skip once off the atmosphere and that we're still going to get the heat, but that helps to reduce some of the G-loads on the crew. Once you're through that, you get to parachute deploy. There's 11 parachutes in total that are going to uh, slow Orion down before it splashes down. We're going to be going from 20,000 miles an hour to about 300 miles an hour before those parachutes deploy. And then they do a final job of getting it in the water in the South Pacific. We've got these big orange balloons, that's an uprighting system. So even if Orion landed in the water upside down, those can, those can inflate and they put us back upright into what's known as stable one. That's where you want your spacecraft to be, nice and upright in the water, especially if you're an astronaut in there floating. Now, we also have a large U.S. Navy ship uh, with a big bay that's going to basically come up and swallow Orion into its deck, and you've got a couple of other assets in the area to help recover hardware, the forward bay cover, parachutes, things like that. But that's scheduled to happen 26 days after a launch today. So that's 26 days from liftoff here in Florida around the moon to a splashdown in the Pacific. And that will be the first mission in the Artemis program. The farthest we've ever sent a human rated spacecraft in history. And just the first step before we put people on board. So that's a look at everything still to come. We're counting down to that launch. I'll send it back over to Megan and the team at the host desk, guys. A very comprehensive look at that. Thank you so much, Dan. If you're just joining us, welcome to Kennedy Space Center and our live coverage of Artemis One, an uncrewed flight test that will return us to the moon in nearly 50 years. But you know, some might ask, why the moon? Well, here's why. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. 
The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the Lunar South Pole to establish the Artemis Base Camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect descending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds. Starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon, capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The Eagle has landed. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. And what we will accomplish there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach as we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step. Throughout this launch broadcast, uh, our NASA's Leah Martin has been introducing us to people over at the uh, Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex who have come out for uh, hopefully the maiden voyage of Artemis One. All right, we're going to let the rah-rah stuff go. <laughs> you can watch that if you want to see the rah-rah stuff. Those are people uh, working over at, the, uh, over at the Kennedy Space Center, and they're talking to different VIPs over at the Saturn V Center, which is... Uh, about three, closer to five miles away. I know that's one of the spots that is a, is a great viewing spot. Uh, it is on the property for Kennedy Space Center, the Saturn V Center. Um, but we're still in the T minus 10 minute hold here. We're still at the T minus 10 minute hold here, and we're waiting for word from NASA on when they're uh, going to pick up the count. Uh, we do. I do feel very confident that we're going to launch today. Um, very, very confident that we're going to go today uh just a matter of you know a couple things that needed to be worked out and i believe the range is probably almost done their testing it doesn't take them very long to uh, reevaluate and make sure th the biggest thing is the safety issue if the rocket does go awry uh the range is responsible for not only tracking uh but flight termination and that was the biggest uh, thing is they didn't have communication to the rocket for flight termination so that was the biggest problem once they get that tested out, we'll be back on the count, and uh, we'll launch this sucker. Um, getting some texts from back home saying, boy, you're having a long day. It is a <laughs> long day, and uh, uh, I just uh, bumped in a new friend of mine I met down here, and uh, they had heard through uh, NASA, uh, NASA Social 
that this should be going up within half an hour now. They still do NASA social or? Is that, that they're here, yes. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I, I, you know. But, uh, yeah, we're just uh, we're just kind of holding on here and just waiting. Uh, I'm just checking my email to see if there's anything from them as well. Um, you never know. Nope, that was an email from yesterday. Yep. <laughs> and I had just looked at my email. The only email I got within the last half hour was a uh, thank you, come again from the uh, hotel we just stayed at. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. We're getting there. Uh, hold on one sec. They only have a few minutes left of work to do before they're ready to pick up polling. And uh, we're also hearing that some of that polling, which kicks off with the mission management team, is also now just about three and a half minutes away. Now, we are currently still in that hold. But uh, the launch team, NASA, NASA's test director, is uh, continuing to move the team forward. We've wrapped up work um, on the upper stage and the lower stage. You're looking now live inside firing room one, where launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson is overseeing her launch team. We've had a number of delays that have put us off the T0, but we are starting to track to a T0 close to around a quarter till, top of the hour. But we do need to have some polling that takes place. I'm pausing now because I'm listening in to the teams as they communicate. In this launch window, which we're currently 26 minutes into, and it's two hours long. It runs until 3.04 a.m. Eastern Time. We have what's called 40 cutouts. And in those cutouts, they range from about a second to about a minute. These are times where they can't launch. These cutouts must be accounted for when determining a new T0. Did not know that. That's actually the, the first I've heard that. The rocket, which was the last to get ready and configured. Just recently, the team cycled the liquid hydrogen valves, 
which is required. And they are currently working on the LO2 valves, liquid oxygen valves in the upper stage. That work is almost done. We are now a minute and a half away from the pole of the mission management team, which is several minutes before T minus 15 minutes. When that pole starts, we'll get a clearer picture of our T zero. You can see a picture inside the Launch Control Center right now. Well, it looks like that. NASA, pole NASA's test on. director has informed the launch team to all switch to a common communication channel. It's called 230, 232. And what this means is that uh, the entire launch team is now on one channel and all future communication will happen there, whereas there are many channels. Now they reduce it down to one. Just heard from NASA test director Carlos Monge. I'm sorry, Jeff Spaulding. Jeff Spaulding's on. They swapped out. There are currently no constraints to launch. Great news. Again, no constraints to launch. And they're getting ready to pick up with a pole to determine readiness for launch. Interesting that they're coming out of this, uh, getting ready to pole, and the moon has just come uncovered from the clouds. I can see stars. Well, I've been able to see the stars overhead for a while now. Yeah. But the moon has been covered uh, in clouds uh, off to our, I would say, uh, southeast. And even looking down towards the pad, it seems like, you know, the fogginess has <sighs> kind of lifted just a little bit. Well, there wasn't any foggy. It was just haze. Oh. Haze. If there was fog, we'd have problems. But uh, yes. there's not. So... That was just a haze coming off the water. The water's still a bit warmer than the air. When I zoom in all the way on the cameras, I see that that uh, that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. But overhead, it's been pretty. Okay, pretty, NASA uh, good. test director Jeff Spaulding getting ready to conduct the readiness poll. So we are getting close. We're going to pull up the audio now so that you can listen in. Please go. And rock. Rock is go. All right. Copy all. And launch director NTD, our launch team is ready to proceed at this time. I copy all NTD. At this time, I will proceed with my poll. And attention on 232, this is the launch director performing the final poll for launch. Verify no constraints and go for launch. EGS Program Chief Engineer. EGS Program Chief Engineer verifies that the EGS, SLS, and Arroyan Program Chief Engineers have no constraints and are go for launch. Copy, Greg. Thank you. EGS Chief Safety Officer. The EGS uh, CSO verifies the SLS, Orion, and EGS CSOs. I have no constraints uh, and are go for launch. Copy, John. Thank you. Range weather. Weather has no constraints and weather is go for launch. Copy, LWO and mission manager. And mission manager, launch director. Launch Director, Mission Manager on 232. The Mission Management Team has been pulled. You have a go to proceed with terminal count and launch of Artemis 1. 
I copy all. Thank you. That was a good and call. And Kitty, launch director. Go ahead, launch director. Yes, sir. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible, and for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, launch director, and thank you. All right, we do have a couple of steps to configure, and then we will be ready to resume the clock. CVSE, NTD. CVSE here. Initiate recording of Orion cameras at this time. In work. R, NTD. RSR here. Perform the booster ignition SNA arm rotation enable. NDT, RSR, booster ignition SNA arm and rotation enable is complete. And I copy. Thank you. Okay. So there you heard the poll from launch director. Early. Getting ready to get that new T0 time. As soon as they initiate the T0, the clock will start. You and heard? It start. And the, the clock has started. So they're a little bit behind us. We're now at T minus nine minute, nine minutes and 50 seconds. And quite a bit of cheering going on up on the uh, new center there. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, for a while, I thought I was at a SpaceX launch. Well, no. <laughs> That's a little bit different. Uh, so in uh, just under nine, nine and a half minutes, we will see uh, the rocket lift off. SLS, the most powerful rocket uh on oh, Earth. rocket operational at this point. Yeah. Uh, some will claim Starship uh, will be when it finally launches, and that's entirely possible. But in the meantime, uh, we're at T-minus 9 minutes and 10 seconds. I know you're seeing the countdown clock. That is the NASA feed is a little bit behind us. So what we'll do is we'll go to our shot of the rocket uh, when we lift off, and we will go from there. So we're seeing shots of the uh, Orion spacecraft ready to go we do know that snoopy is ready for his flight to the moon <laughs> you didn't get that part did you uh, i'm trying to decide whether or not i'm going to say something you know i'm going to say it perhaps while orion is orbiting the moon that we could maybe look for alice no no i wonder how many people would even get that reference most people won't yeah I'm hoping that my camera here will work. Um, we're attempting an auto track, and it's bouncing around right now because there's people walking through the shot. But we're going to manually track, and we're going to auto track this rocket. We'll see if both work. I'm, I'm recording both of them just in case. T minus 7 minutes and 50 seconds left. It is being confused right now. Let's reset the profile and go for the top of the rocket. So many people walking in front right now that uh, it's it's getting a little confused. Of course, all day long, we're nobody here. Uh, but now it's a little busy around here. Team on is seven minutes and ten seconds and counting. Everybody and their brother is coming out. Hopefully nobody blocks our cameras. And I'm hearing people in front of us saying down in front as some additional people are moving in. One person with a ladder. You may want to check your shot. About six and a half minutes to go. Just updating a cousin that uh, had texted me that lives down here in Florida. 
gave her the update. By the time she gets a text message, it will be correct. We're all getting in here launch mode with just under six minutes to go. Finally, everybody gets a little busy around here. With it's like coming to a, a baseball game. You're better off up on the hill. <laughs> This won't be a problem for our cameras once it clears the tower. We'll be above everybody's heads at that point and we'll be tracking the rocket. About five minutes remain before liftoff. We're seeing all kinds of people of shapes and sizes and different things. The moon is uh, right above us, above the countdown clock and ready to receive its next visitor. NASA safety personnel are keeping people out of the hazard zones here. There are some gullies out here. As you can see, that flame off to the right is uh, hydrogen burning off. That's consistently been happening all night, so that's nothing to worry about. Now at T-minus four minutes and just over 15 seconds to go until liftoff. Countdown clock continues with no constraints. And you have a beautiful view of the pad from our WCPC cameras. It's actually a very historic occasion. We're going back to the moon as a species for the first time with a manned craft, even though there won't be any man man in it man rated craft three my under 330 left to go before liftoff and this is testing new systems and testing the first flight of the artemis spacecraft it's come a long way since the moon uh, in the 60s where we can fly a complete mission with ground controllers and we'll get to witness the world's world's most powerful operational rocket in just about uh, just under three minutes. I'm going to let the uh, rocket do the talking when we go here. And you'll be able to hear uh, the crowd around us as we pull up the microphone. The shotgun microphone uh, that we placed out here just to get some directional audio from the rocket. 2.30 left. Now, the first stage boosters will light right at the T0 mark, and once they are committed to flight, that rocket will lift off no matter what. They will provide most of the thrust during the initial ascent phase. The four shuttle-era RS-25 engines mounted on the bottom of the core stage, which you see that red-orange tank which you saw during the shuttle, T minus two minutes. Uh, they will, they do not provide enough thrust, those four engines on liftoff, to make the rocket go. That's why you need the solid rocket boosters. They'll burn for a total, the stack will burn for about a total of about eight minutes and place uh, the Orion spacecraft into nearly orbit. It's pretty close, uh, just from the burn. T minus 130. Uh, after separation from the first stage, um, you will see a lot of events happening. The uh, inter integrate intermediate cryogenic propulsion stage, which is a centaur, 
which is a centaur, will bring it into orbit and then give it a kick into translunar, T minus 110. And then the service stage built by the European Space Agency will kick it into translunar orbit and provide course correction en route. I have 45, 42, 41. Getting ready for liftoff here. T minus 30. T minus 20. And I'll make the call since NASA is a little behind. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition and liftoff of the SLS. SLS has cleared the tower. Hell of a show here in person as SLS pitches downrange. And believe it or not, I can't even keep track of it. Feel the SLS pitch downrange, and you're hearing that as it pitches downrange. Quite the show here for SLS. Going through the first cloud layer. Piercing through the cloud, cloud layer now. I'm sure NASA can give you the stats, but what a show. SLS is now downrange. Now SLS will start going horizontal as it picks up speed to achieve its orbit path. What a rocket liftoff. Unlike the Apollo era where it lumbered off the pad because it was all solid fuel motors with the uh, with the, sorry, liquid fuel motors. With the SLS, now we're getting to the upper atmosphere, you're seeing things turn blue. And you're gonna see SRB separation should be short. A of SRB separation. SRB separation as the core stage continues to move on. SR SRBs have now burnt out. And the core stage continues onto orbit. Trying to track this is very becoming very interesting. As the SR, as the core stage goes downrange, you will probably see the boosters falling through. We can see some of the booster. See the booster burnout falling down overhead. SLS passes, core stage is passing under the moon right now. A 
and this joystick is fighting me. Can still see the SLS downrange, core stage, still visible from from the Kennedy Space Center, as it is a nice lo night launch. Let that drop out, and I'm going to go over to this telemetry feed. We can still see the core stage burning uh, here from the Kennedy Space Center. We're watching telemetry on the air right now. The core stage will burn for a total of eight minutes, so... As it continues to go down range, we'll still see it here from the Kennedy Space Center. That is amazing. We can still visibly see it as a bright star on the, uh, on the horizon. Oh, good. I'm glad the NASA tracking cameras are having similar problems to what I was having. <laughs> they try. Now we're getting into the haze as it uh, reaches closer to the horizon as it's going down range. We still see it as a bright star, though. And it's dropping lower on the horizon as it goes around the curvature of the Earth. Still burning for about another two and a half minutes. We're now losing sight of the SLS. It's become a dimmer star on the horizon. It's falling behind the clouds out to sea. Still just barely see it out there on the horizon. And the NASA feed is about 20 seconds behind. We're at T plus 645. Mission Control Houston. Teams continue to monitor this first flight. Here at the Kennedy Space Center. Crowds are milling about. About a minute and a half now until that core stage main engine cutoff time. Our four core stage engines continue to fire maximum thrust. All RS-25 engines are performing nominally. And Houston has taken over the call of the uh, launch. Coming up on seven minutes since launch today, now traveling over 12,800 miles per hour, 563 miles downrange. Again, still quiet here in Mission Control, Houston. As we prepare for main engine cutoff, the four RS-25 engines are beginning to throttle down. Thirty seconds now until core stage main engine cutoff. All four engines continue to throttle down. Now seven minutes forty-five seconds into the flight, traveling over sixteen thousand miles per hour. Continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston. We're standing by for core stage main engine cutoff. And we have confirmation of core stage main engine cutoff. Orion is now in Earth's orbit. The flight yep. dynamics officer reports that we have a nominal main engine cutoff. 
and we just heard the call for core stage separation. That means Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage are now flying free from the core stage of the space launch system. The next milestone will be solar array deploy approximately 18 minutes after liftoff. But before Orion stretches its wings, let's check back in with our friends at Kennedy Space Center and hear all about what it was like to hear the rocket roar off the launch pad. Megan and Kayla, I've got to hear all about it. <laughs> well, if you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where we just watched Artemis One launch, our first step towards our next. So, Kenny, uh, since we're here, why don't you want to take a look at the replays that we got? The tracking system did not work, but uh, let's Six, take a look at what we heard. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff of the SLS. It started to. SLS has cleared the tower. <laughs> Amazing how it lit up the uh, the entire sky, and you could feel that in your chest oh. as it pitched down range. When it went down range, uh, it was just thumping your Hell chest. Hell of a show here in person as SLS pitches down range. And believe it or not, I can't even keep track of it. You can hear that noise. Let's take a look at it from the camera. T minus that I was able And to right track. there, that buffering is what you feel in the chest down here. I didn't I ISO your camera, so we'd have to wait for the. I'll ten, upload a, a nine. You know, eight. So this is what I got with the uh, six, joystick. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. And liftoff of the SLS. SLS has cleared the tower. Hell of a show here in person as SLS pitches downrange. And believe it or not, I can't even keep track of it. It's true. Feel the SLS pitch downrange, and you're hearing that. There's that, that buffer yeah, as wait, it wait, pitches downrange. 